My name is Marcella Alshon. I'm a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School, and I'm presenting our panel, which is diagnosing the ills of the US healthcare system. And uh, I feel doubly honored not just to be here, but to be on a panel with um, colleagues I hold in such uh, truly high regard. So we have Ileana Koziemko, who's a professor at Princeton. Um, she is obviously now at Princeton, but was a deputy assistant secretary for economic policy in the US Treasury. She helped um, implement the ACA in the early days. And we have Zach Cooper, who's a professor at Yale University and has done um, groundbreaking work on, um, on costs and, uh, and surprise billing um, in our system. And, um, and my work focuses on health equity. So if the slides are ready, it looks like they are. Go ahead and um, kick us off. So I'll be talking today about health gradients and, uh, and preventive care. So in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, about, you know, still <laughs> imagine 1.5 years into it, um, I wrote a paper alongside uh, Kosali Simon from Indiana University and Amitabh Chandra. Here we were asked to write something for JEP on looking at the first um, year of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States and what had happened in terms of health effects. Um, now, Initially, we had really high hopes for this paper. We were going to dig in and, and look at all different types of data sets. Um, but what you'll notice about the US healthcare system, perhaps point number one, is just that the data are really bad. One of the costs of not having a healthcare system, which is kind of um, harmonized in any way, is that it's actually really difficult to get um, data. And so if we wanted to look at something other than death, um, we and we were interested in heterogeneity across different groups, i.e. inequality, we would confront things like this. And you can just look at the numbers um, and look at the distribution of COVID-19 cases that actually have missing race or ethnicity data um, by county across the US. So if you see a focus in the United States on you know, mortality rates or life expectancy, note that that is oftentimes due to the fact that we don't have a universal system. So we were um, taking stock using crude, first of all, calculating crude mortality rates, um, which is in that left panel. And as you can see, even just, you know, just taking crude COVID-19 mortality rates, it was higher for black and AIAN Americans than for white or Asian Americans. And then in panel B, when you age adjust, you see that that disparity actually increases quite significantly. And I kind of dubbed this an inequality on top of an inequality, specifically when you're looking at AIAN or black Americans who their distribution of age is skewed younger because of premature morbidity and mortality. Hispanic Americans have different demographic reasons, but certainly when you age adjust, you can see those um, disparities are even more pronounced. Now, more recently, the NCHS, um, the National Center of Health Statistics in the United States, has looked at this now, not only in the first year of the pandemic, but going back down into the, out into uh, 2021 as well. And, you know, it's, it's been really across the board. On average, we've seen uh, almost a 1.6, closer actually now to two year drop in life expectancy on average, but you can see that it hasn't hit all groups equally. So for um, black individuals who already had a, a much lower life expectancy than white or Asian Americans, you can see that they are now lost four years of life expectancy from the pandemic. AIAN, seven years of life expectancy. So not um, barely reaching uh, 65. And Hispanic Americans who have something known as sort of the healthy immigrant combination of selection and societal factors tend to enjoy a higher life expectancy than would be predicted by their socioeconomic status. They took one of the largest hits as well. Um, now, when we compare the United States, and um, I think Ileana will do more of this, to other OECD countries, we see that we really do um, kind of stand out. So the OECD average is there in orange. The lighter orange um, is COVID-19 deaths. Um, the darker orange bars or the darker bars in general are excess deaths overall. And you can see the United States um, in green there, it fared very, very poorly. Um, basically, there are a few Eastern European countries and Mexico uh, are the only OECD countries that actually 
did worse in the United States. And we did worse both on COVID-19 deaths and then excess deaths more broadly, which could be a fact of congestion or people not going to the hospital, um, et cetera. Now, obviously, early days of the pandemic, you know, what could be driving differential death rates? There wasn't a cure. We didn't have Pax, Pax COVID yet or um, anything close to that. But there was obviously uh, the distribution of information from public health officials. Eventually, there were vaccines. And of course, even when you came to the hospital, the degree of illness that you had at the time of presentation certainly influenced your probability of survival, um, conditional on making it uh, there. So I've been interested in preventative care for quite a long time. And prior to coming to Harvard, um, Harvard I was at Stanford, um, closer to Oakland, California, and was very interested in one of the levers that had been suggested for reducing those racial health inequalities that have only increased over this time period, which is diversifying um, the physician workforce. So this is the current um, composition of the physician workforce. You can see that it's about 56% white, 17% um, Asian, and then black Americans, Hispanic Americans are about five, I'm sorry, black physicians and Hispanic American, Hispanic physicians are five and 6% respectively. And they are much, much less than their population shares. So in the latest 2020 census, there's about 13.7% individuals that identify as black, about 18% that identify as Hispanic. So um, represented, underrepresented relative to their population shares. So uh, we endeavored to test this hypothesis that had been put forward by leading medical institutes that if you diversify the physician workforce and have a, a workforce that more nearly represents the population it's trying to serve, you could actually um, gain trust such that people would take up preventative care. Because remember, preventative care is different. You don't actually feel unwell, you generally feel fine. So trust is an uh, integral component. So we had this two-stage double-blind randomized um, design. In the first stage, people just saw a tablet with a photo of a doctor that they were randomly assigned to. Um, they would select these preventative services on a tablet, blood pressure, cholesterol, BMI, diabetes, and flu shots. And then in the second stage, they would actually get a chance to meet with that doctor in person. And um, it was really important that we set up a pop-up clinic, not because we wanted to do that ex ante, it was only because we simply couldn't find enough black male physicians to staff a clinic. We couldn't find a clinic that had one and we needed several in order to be able to do this exercise. Um, so why did we have these two different stages? So in the first stage, um, it's basically your canonical correspondence study. You're just showing them a picture, giving them some basic um, information, all standardized about the quality, and then seeing if uh, you see differences in demand. That would be consistent with either, you know, taste-based discrimination, or it could represent, you know, internalized racism. We didn't know, you know, we uh, we didn't know um, prior to doing this equipoise. We didn't know what we would find. However, if we didn't see differences until the second stage, after the doctor and the patient had actually had a chance to interact, that might actually suggest there's something about the match quality, something about um, the efficiency of communication, perhaps, the quality of the, you know, what Ken Arrow called the patient um, physician product. Okay, so what did we find? So these are just bar graphs that show the um, average demand for different preventative care um, where the averages for gray are those that were randomized to a non-black MD. These are white or Asian, very similar to the composition of the US physician workforce, or they were randomized to a black male MD. And what we see is that really nothing at all. So in our pre-consultation stage, when we just have these tablet photos, there's really no differences across the two groups um, that uh, was detectable. We do think that people were attending to the tablet because you can see that diabetes and cholesterol had lower demand than blood pressure and BMI. Diabetes and cholesterol, we indicated, actually required a needle prick. When you go, though, to the post-consultation phase, now you can see really large differences in how much demand um, that was able to uh, be encouraged after the patient and the doctor actually get a chance to meet and talk in person. Um, so we're looking about in, you know, gains of 20 percentage points. At, if we look at this in percent form instead, uh, we can see that now percent is on the um, 
on the y-axis and the different preventatives are on the x-axis, we can see that we're talking about gains in the 20 to 40% range for non-invasives, things that don't require blood, and then, um, and then for the more invasive things or the injections, we're seeing gains in the 50 to 70% range. So our back of the envelope calculation suggested that that could actually reduce racial gaps in male cardiovascular mortality by, um, by 19%. And just to point out that by invasive here, that's very casual and probably even misleading term. You can think about how invasive is, for example, a colonoscopy for those in that age demographic. Um, so we've kind of uh, taken this to a new, uh, you know, interrogated this a little bit more, more recently looking at clinical trials. Um, so this is, uh, this is in joint work with Josh Schwartzstein at HBS, Heidi Williams, and two graduate students at Stanford, Harsh Gupta and Maya Dervasala. And basically what we did here is we actually randomized both the efficacy of the drug that the doctor saw and the racial composition of the evidence base itself. So i.e. of the trial base um, of the composition of the subjects in the trial. And so um, what we find, these are our PWPs is our little acronym for physicians that treat white patients. We see on this nice upward sloping line suggesting the more efficacious your drug, um, the more likely the physician will prescribe it. That's very natural and what you would hope any good um, physician would do. When we look at physicians that treat even some black patients, and this is um, actually pretty linear, the higher the share of black patients in their sample, the greater the degree to which they're sensitive to this, we see that when they actually see a non-representative sample, it's the same positive slope, so more efficacious, um, more prescribing, um, but, uh, but it's just a level shift down. Yet we can actually close that gap when we provide a more representative data set to those physicians. Um, so this is kind of similar in the sense that if you think the suppliers of the information here are firms, uh, representation matters to the demander, who in this case is physicians. Um, similarly, when the supply is the doctor themselves, that seemed to matter to the patient who was demanding the preventive. But I guess it does um, um, beg the question, does preventative care really matter? Um, according to the CDC, by their estimates, if everyone in the United States received recommended clinical preventive care, we could save over 100,000 lives. Um, and then does the medical insurance system really matter for preventative care in the United States and health equity more generally? Well, this is actually um, inspired by a graduate st a student here at Harvard, uh, Sumit Agrawal, who's both an MD, PhD, doing his residency. And he noticed that, um, as Amy Finkelstein had you know, years earlier, that there's this quirk of um, the way that, you know, when the ACA was passed, it said that private insurers had to cover um, specific vaccines. But Medicare actually, when the initial bill for medical, Medicare was passed in the 1960s, it didn't cover preventative care. And every vaccine has basically required an authorization by Congress in order to get it um, covered. And so, um, and so just by, again, by sort of an accident, um, Part B has over time covered pneumonia, pneumococcal vaccination, influenza vaccination. So Amy used that rollout to look at how scale encourages innovation and more recently the COVID vaccination without cost sharing. But shingles just happened to be under Part D, which actually only about um, two thirds to three quarters, depending on the estimates of Medicare beneficiaries even have. And it was subject to a cost sharing rate of about $175. Um, so you can see that not only are you now taking the patient out of the doctor's office, you're, most of the contracts between Medicare Part D is with um, pharmacies. Um, so you can see that there's an overall lower coverage rate there, but then you're also subjecting them to cost sharing. There is a low income subsidy, but that has incomplete take up as well. So we see that the mean here is lower at 46% than those other vaccinations. And then the gradient between um, those who are lower income and higher income is much, much larger um, through this kind of accident, uh, if you will, of policy. Um, now, the, the next question um, is kind of this canonical question, what does health insurance do? Does it uh, save lives? Does it not save lives? Um, and, and also, do, how does it affect equity? So this is obviously the sort of uh, most important paper, I think, that 
um, used a regression discontinuity design to clearly show that, um, again, with unavoidable admissions, that there was a one percentage point drop in seven day, day mortality once patients actually received uh, Medicare. But more recently, what's been shown is there's actually an equity component to that too. Now, this is um, Jacob Wallace and colleagues um, who's from Yale looking in JAMA Internal Medicine. And you can see these pretty impressive drops. Again, think back to that COVID-19 mortality picture. Think back who was really, um, who was really dying at very high rates. It was Hispanic individuals who have uninsured rates, about 18% black individuals uninsured rates about 13%. And you can see that once they hit 65, you see these big dramatic drops. Hispanic now is in blue. Um, black individuals are in orange. Pretty dramatic drops in rates of uninsured. Um, share without a usual source of care. And you know, one, again, coming back to my first point, some of the data limitations, they can't actually look at like um, administrative health outcomes in these data because it's survey data, but they do find that people self-report better um, health uh, once getting access. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I think you know the, the jury is in, the autopsy has been done, the US did much, much worse than peer countries with respect to COVID-19. Inequality was bad, it got really worse, and health inequality is particularly offensive to our sensibilities if you're an economist, if you're a doctor, if you're anything in between. Um, some of my research has shown that in heterogeneous society, representation on the supply side, and I mean that very, very broadly, can improve demand. Uh, and we're talking about representation in the evidence space that firms then supply to doctors, or representation in who you actually see when you're sick and infirm, um, or you're actually getting advice when you don't feel sick and infirm. I think the key question for us um, is what are the policies needed to make the US more resilient to health shocks in the future? How do we go from a failing grade to something that's marginally passing? And with that, I'll turn it over to Ileana, um, who'll talk about cross-country comparisons um, in more detail. Thank you. Hey, can everybody hear me? Just give me one second to grab my... And can everybody see the slides? All right, um, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Marcella, for uh, teeing up my talk. Um, I would love to be there in person. I actually just had a baby three months ago, so it was just um, you know hugely more convenient um, to join you uh, via uh, Zoom today. Um, this is also the first time I am presenting this uh, set of slides, uh, so I apologize in advance for sort of any uh, half-baked thoughts. Um, so I, as Marcella said, my my experience as a health economist, I'm kind of a fake health economist. I only got into health econ. Um, because I served uh, in the Obama administration um, in 2009 and 2010. And just by chance, what I was assigned to uh, was working on the um, implementation and also the pre, you know, getting the bill itself ready uh, for the Affordable Care Act. And so a lot of my, a lot of my uh, knowledge about, you know, health insurance and the U.S. system in particular comes from that period. So, uh, you know, one thing you heard a lot if you were deep into that um, debate uh, or deep into that process as a observer or if you were in it was that, you know, the U.S. had the best healthcare system in the world. And you would just hear this, you know, on the Republican side, you would hear this as the U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. Um, why are you going to mess it up? Uh, why change it? Um, and on the Democratic side, you would also hear that in a slightly different um uh, tone. Well, the U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. We're just trying to give it to more access to more people, or we're just trying to make it even better. Um, and I remember, you know, more in retrospect, I think I was kind of caught up in the moment at the time, contrasting that with what you heard about K through 12 education, especially public education, which is that it was in crisis. Um, you know, Obama, President Obama said in 2009, 
you know, we've settled into a mediocrity when we compare ourselves to other advanced countries. And so I was really, you know, looking back, kind of um, interested in that contrast in terms of how policymakers and pundits talk about these two, you know, huge sectors of our economy. So, you know, do we have the best healthcare system in the world? And, you know, as Marcella said, it's actually even hard to look at some things because the U.S., once you get to the age 65 population, it's a little bit better because we do have a more unified system with Medicare. But in terms of our overall population health, it's hard to go beyond in the U.S., um, you know, crude, potentially crude measures, life, life expectancy. But this is, you know, a graph you've probably seen. This is um, from our world in data. Um, I here am looking at um, life expectancy. Uh, this is, I believe, 2019 data. Um, and then here I'm even looking at logged. I'm logged the x-axis, so it doesn't look quite so crazy. I mean, if I didn't log it, the US would look even further out from the pack. But this does not look like the best healthcare system in the world. Um, I'm kind of smiling right now because I saw a um, tweet just like yesterday saying that, you know, any person that sort of runs this regression of life expectancy on health expenditure is not a serious person and I'll um so I apologize for the you know being a little uh, for running this regression and I'm going to you know run some others that are you know similar but I do think there's something we can learn about this um about the US you know is there is there room for improvement and you know I think this sort of calls into question this idea that we just have the best healthcare system and we don't have anything to learn from other countries um and just I'm not going to dwell on education. We're going to have a great education panel um, later in um, the conference. But I do think it's sort of interesting as to why policymakers and pundits treat K through 12 education so harshly, but feel like they have to always, you know, begin any discussion of healthcare with, you know, U.S. supremacy. Um, the U.S. is in the middle of the pack when it comes to K through 12 public plus private education spending as a share of GDP. We're 15 of the 34 OECD countries that I could find. Um, and we're sort of in the middle of the pack in outcomes. So in PISA, we're ninth in reading, 30th in math, that, that does sound pretty bad, um, and 13th in science. So, you know, just to contrast, uh, you know, how we think of these two sectors. And of course, in education, you know, um, again, across, across the political spectrum, Democrats and Republicans have this view, there should be no excuses, no excuses for poor educational outcomes. And so that, you know, sort of leads the title to my talk that we should have no excuses as well when it comes to our um, system, our healthcare system. But in fact, um, from a lot of pundits and policymakers, you do hear a lot of excuses um, for the U.S. healthcare system. So uh, I'm just taking um, uh, uh, this is from a sub stack of a very prominent um, center left uh, uh, pundit. Uh, who calls America's life expectancy weirdly short, given how rich the country is. Um, and then writes a common left wing knee jerk reaction is that this reflects deficiencies of the American healthcare system, but I think that's mostly wrong, um, is, is what the pundit says. So um, the common excuses that are used to explain this, this strange outcome of the US spending so much money on healthcare, not only are we a really rich country, but we, ex we spend an outlier amount of that money on healthcare. Um, with the bad outcomes that we saw in life expectancy. So I think the three uh, most common explanations that are given are external causes of death that um, the, the assumption is healthcare can't explain. So car accidents, homicides, suicide, overdoses, America's uniquely unhealthy habits, and that Americans just wastefully consume healthcare. So we consume so much of it, that's why we are um, spending so much money on healthcare. Um, and we don't we don't consume it in any like you know rational way. We don't have skin in the game. We don't become good shoppers for our healthcare. So I'm going to talk about each of these three a little bit in turn. Um, so what do I have here? This is that same. This is a similar graph: the life expectancy versus health share of GDP. That I was you know sort of warned. And I know a lot of health economists don't love this kind of analysis, but I think we can learn a little bit when we separate out men and women. So here on the left is men and here on the right is women. And, you know, they look pretty much they look quite similar. Like you wouldn't like say, oh, well, you know, once you drop men, uh, you know, we, the sort of U.S. exceptionalism goes away. So why have I separated men and women? Well, first, the main point is that all of these external um, uh, causes of death, which are, you know, which are um, viewed as reasons why the U.S., 
spends so much money, but also has low, low uh, life expectancy are much more important for male um, mortality. So people have done um, these uh, uh, exercises where you drop all of those external causes of death and you could you know, explain maybe half of the US gap um, in male mortality. Um, of course, not, you know, once you adjust for like how much we spend, forget that for the moment, but just, you know, can we get this, this uh, red dot to be a little bit higher up with the rest of these blue dots? Um, but you can't do that for female mortality because all of these, all of these external accidents, all these, all these external causes of death are like three to one in terms of male to female ratios and some of them even higher. And yet you sort of see a very similar picture uh, for women as well. So, um, you know, this this just can't go all the way to explaining U.S. exceptionalism. Um, the other sort of statistical point to make, and you can't see this from this graph because this is just a point in time, but if you look over at, you know, this graph, which has, um, you know, points in, uh, which has each of these, um, each of these points is a year times country, uh, some of these external causes of death, in particular homicide, which is important because it really um, targets a low age population, so it has disproportionate impact on longevity because it's cutting uh, a, a life very short, have dropped significantly, right? So homicide rates in the US, they've gone up a little bit in um, since COVID, um, but in 2019, which is what I'm looking at here, they were at a very low point relative to the 1990s. So in terms of changes, some of these external causes of death is actually some wind at our back, like we should be doing better in, on changes and we haven't seen that. Um, the third point I wanna make about these external deaths is linking back to something Marcella said, which is if we look at COVID and COVID was purely a health shock, right? It was a new novel virus. There's not, um, I, you can't explain it. You can't explain our performance in COVID, which was very poor. And I think actually even poorer, I'll come back to that than if you just look at the crude data. So when the whole world was faced with a health shock, um, the US also performed very poorly. And I think that's hard to not blame, at least in part, our healthcare and health insurance system. Um, and I think I had one more point, but I don't, oh, sorry, yes. And the last point, which I think is maybe the most important, is this idea that our healthcare system just plays no role in external causes of death. And I'll give you, you know, car accidents and homicides are probably beyond the purview of a healthcare system, but suicides and overdoses, you know, are um, potentially related to access to addiction and mental health care. And in particular, the overdoses, um, the, the, the most recent increase in overdoses comes from opioids, which were marketed um, to US uh, consumers as safe uh, by you know, for-profit uh, pharma companies, which again is kind of a US exception in terms of like how we organize our, um, how we allow you know, companies to market. And um, so I think again, the idea that you know, overdoses and suicides are just beyond you know, the um, responsibility of the healthcare system is also a very strong assumption that the um, external causes of death um, view takes. Okay. Uh, so that was one, um, uh, you know, special exception that the U.S. Um, has is all these external causes of death. Um, the second uh, uh, explanation for U.S. exceptionalism in terms of high cost and um, bad outcomes is just that you know Americans are fat slobs uh, that we have incredibly unhealthy lifestyles. Um, and so therefore it's not really the health, the, the, the fault of our healthcare system. And that it's definitely true. Um, I don't wanna say otherwise that the US is an outlier in terms of obesity. Um, in changes, I think that's actually um, unfortunately um, going in the other direction because other nations are becoming overweight as well. Um, and so they're catching up a little bit with the US but even so the US is still uh, quite an outlier in that. And that's, um, you know, Potentially, again, we can't say that's not related to the healthcare system, especially given some of the work that Marcella just um, showed in terms of, you know, access um, to care might be able to reduce the consequences or even reduce potentially um, obesity itself. But uh, it is definitely the case that Americans are overweight um, more than our other countries. But that doesn't stop there. I mean, that there are actually important ways in which the U.S. is healthier um, than other countries. Um, the low smoking rate, the US, Americans don't smoke relative to our European and other rich country peers. And that's true in both levels and changes. So currently we're low smokers, but we used to be the world's leading smokers, probably just because we were rich in the 1950s and 60s. So in changes, in terms of the decline in smoking, we are also an outlier. We've declined, we've um, lowered our smoking rate more than any other country. Um, 
And so again, we should see that showing up both in um, changes, declines in mortality uh, due to um, lung cancer and other consequences of smoking and also as the level, but we really haven't seen that. Um, and then we also don't consume much alcohol relative to our peers. And the thing that I don't think we talk enough about, especially as it relates to costs. So again, we're trying to explain this weird congruence of high spending as a share of GDP and bad outcomes is that Americans are young relative to our uh, rich peers. And um, just the age structure of society is a huge predictor in terms of how much um, a country spends um, as a share of its GDP on health. So here is the share of population that is over 65. There's a definite relationship with you know, the elderly share and how much um, that country spends in terms of share GDP on health. And here's the US, a relatively young country that is spending you know, way off the regression line. And I also wanted to, um, you know, here I think is a point we need to remember when we think about what Marcella showed us in terms of COVID response. The U.S., if you age adjust, I mean, COVID was a virus that targeted with relative um, precision the elderly. Um, we know that was the number one risk factor. And so, you know, how bad the mortality response was to COVID. I don't know if the if the graph that um, Marcella showed was age adjusted, but if you start age adjusting, um, the response to COVID and not just look at um, excess death and COVID related death, the US's performance is even more troubling. Um, and the final point um, that you hear is, oh, you know, Americans just use so much health care, we're rich, we don't think too much before we see the doctor. That I think at this point is maybe well known to not be true um, due to some of the great work that Zach has done following up on some original work by my late colleague, Uva Reinhard. Um, Americans don't see the doctor in part because we don't have many doctors. We are um, a country that has very few doctors per capita relative to our peers. Of course, it's a big sector. You can find you can find exceptions. There are certain specialties that maybe we overconsume or at least consume more than other countries. We get more imaging done, so CTs and MRIs. I could show you many many graphs. I'm just going to show you one here of just you know consultations per person. Um, you can see both the growth that you can see 2000 and 2017 and the US is over here. So the idea that you know we should think twice before we see the doctor, we should have more cost sharing, it seems a little bit like trying to squeeze blood from a stone because relative to other rich countries and the countries below us are actually quite um, you know, quite poor, um, it seems like that would be kind of hard to do. Like that's maybe not the first place to go. And instead, as as um, Uva suggested, and as, as Zach has shown, um, a lot of the variation in spending can be explained um, by how much we pay for each unit of healthcare that we consume. Um, but again, there's been this focus, especially when I was, um, you know, in the um, during the ACA period, on quantities. So you know, Obama in 2010 said, you know people, doctors are just being rewarded for the quality, for the quantity of care, not the quality. And that's really bad. And that leads to, um, th that's what's leading the growth of healthcare costs. Michael Bloomberg, when he was running for president, um, you know, was saying the way that we should save healthcare is to like deny prostate cancer care to a 95 year old. We know from past work, the US is not an outlier in terms of end of end of uh, life care. It's a big country. I'm sure you can find a 95 year old that wanted aggressive treatment for prostate cancer, but that's just not where the actual, um, you know, overspending is happening. So I'll just close with um, what is unique about the US, if there's nothing that unique, you know, in the three sort of excuses, or if each of those excuses, you know, doesn't seem to explain the whole discrepancy, what is unique about the US is our large private insurance system, which is tasked with, you know, many important, um, many important jobs. It negotiates prices with providers, which is something that typically doesn't happen in other countries where the government is the one that sets prices. It tries to create bargaining power by creating these networks that are, I think, quite co confusing for consumers. You don't know if you can see um, a doctor, at least to this sort of surprise billing. It seems to negotiate these prices relatively poorly because we know that for many standard um, uh, procedures, we pay a lot more than um, do people in other countries. Um, you know, one, one, again, sort of explanation or excuse you often hear about why it can't really be the U.S. insurance sector is that, oh, other countries also have private insurance. Germany is often given as an example of like, oh, you know, Germany relies on private insurance as well. But I think if you really dig into it, there's just no, um, there's no comparison of the U.S. insurance sector, private um, health insurance sector to other countries. So I just looked at the employment 
Um, and again, Germany is given as this example of a country that also relies on private insurance. The US has four times per capita the number of health insurance employees. Um, than does Germany. That number actually looks even um, worse if you compare it to healthcare workers because Germany has more healthcare workers per capita than the U.S. does. So I just think this, you know, there is obviously, I think, a U.S. exception in terms of the way that we've structured our health insurance and healthcare system. So with all, you know, apologies for doing all these cross-country regressions um, and cross-country comparisons, they're obviously always incomplete. Um, and life expectancy uh, especially has many other um, factors besides our healthcare system. I definitely agree with that. But I think the most conspicuous difference between the U.S. and peers uh, to help explain that, you know, U.S. exceptionalism is the way we organize our insurance and healthcare system. So now I am going to hand it off to Zach, whose work I've already um, cited and am very, uh, very eager to hear um, to hear his presentation. So let me stop sharing and hand it off uh, to Zach. Stop share, stop share. Email share. traffic. So thanks everybody for, for coming and thanks for having us. This is, I, I tell you, this is the most fun panel I could, I could be on. So I'm huge fans of, of Ileana and, and Marcella. Um, what I wanna talk about today is that I think in a lot of ways, the problem in the US isn't one where we don't know what to do to fix it. It's really the political will to fix it. And I think it's gonna get back to some of the, the points Stephanie made about really big political economy challenges in the US, that there's really no constituency for efficiency in US healthcare. And in some ways, I actually think that's a really good role for economists, right? Can we be the constituency for efficiency. And I, I want to make this argument by telling the story of surprise medical bills. Um, because I think it really illustrates, in a sense, why health spending in the US is high, um, that progress can be made, and the huge challenges we face making progress. Now, to sort of set this up, I think there are three really important points that really should anchor our discussion of healthcare spending in the US. So the first is we spend $4.3 trillion a year. And the reason I say that is if the US health system was a country, it's about the fourth largest country in the world. Right? It's about the size of the entirety of the German economy. And the reason I say that is one of the things that tells me is there's not one thing wrong with the US healthcare system anything any more than there's like one thing wrong in the German economy. Right? There are lots of things that are wrong. The second is just like in Germany, where there are some dark alleys where crime takes place and unethical behavior exists. The same thing happens in the US healthcare system. There are dark alleys where unethical behavior takes place. The second point is we have a really big challenge addressing that because the healthcare industry in the US spends more on lobbying than any other industry by far. And so in many ways that makes making progress on addressing some of these sort of unethical behaviors really tough. And the third, and this sort of relates to the political economy, is that the harms from some of those bad behaviors fall disproportionately on the most vulnerable in society who often don't have agency and voice in politics. And the rents often go to the top, who have much more. Right, and so let's look at this through the lens of surprise billing. So we spend a lot on emergency room care in the US. It's about 10% of health spending. Ileana alluded to this. One of the, the sort of really weird parts of the US healthcare system is that hospitals and physicians independently negotiate networks with insurance companies. And so you can go to an in-network hospital in an emergency and get treated by an out-of-network physician. Right, that, that's insane. And so as a result, the patient sort of does the right thing. They go to an in-network hospital, they get seen by an out-of-network physician. And all of a sudden, as Fiona and I, Scott Morton and I showed, they can get this sort of $700 bill on average that they didn't expect and couldn't avoid. And why is this sort of such a big issue? The average American doesn't have $400 in liquidity. And so for most of the folks in this room, a $700 bill is really gonna piss you off 
but you're not going to be sort of financially imperiled, the majority of Americans will. The second is this really undercuts the market for healthcare services in the US. So it allows these physicians to negotiate much, much higher prices than they otherwise would. And so we've shown some work that um, emergency room physicians as a share of Medicare basically get paid double what other physicians would get. And there have been a lot of public, there have been a lot of public reporting that it showed sort of incidental cases of this. There's a lot of work in the New York Times by Libby Rosenthal. And I was really interested in sort of seeing how systemic this was. And so Fiona Scott Morton and I looked at it, published a paper in the New England Journal that found that basically one in five patients who went to an in-network hospital were treated by an out-of-network physician. And we sort of said, wow, that's, that's shocking. Right, if it's half a percent, the solution is a GoFundMe page. Right, if it's 20%, calls for policy. Now, I want you to sort of really look into this map and just sort of remember the places that are dark blue, which is where this is happening a lot. The second thing we did is tried to see the distribution of the incidence of out-of-network billing across hospitals. Right, so this is basically saying, what's the distribution of hospital share of out-of-network physicians across hospitals in the US? And what you see is actually most hospitals don't have out-of-network physicians. They're doing a pretty good job. But about 15% of hospitals don't have any in-network hospitals. And so we were like, okay, well, who, who are these 15% of hospitals that are just sort of not having any in-network doctors? This is where the US health system, I think, really starts to look different. So this is an investment uh, advising report from William Blair and Company. And so investors may be, and you and I was surprised, uh, to learn that roughly two thirds of hospitals outsource their ED services. This outsourcing trend is primarily driven by the difficulty of efficiently staffing and managing an ED. Right, so literally the majority of hospitals actually bring in external companies to manage their emergency rooms. And I think one of the challenges we all have is we all live in places with academic medical centers that are part of the like 20% that don't do this. Most places do do this. And the two leading physician staffing companies, one's called MCARE, it's a subsidiary of KKR, which is the largest private equity firm in the US. The other is Team Health, which is owned by Blackstone. Um, these sort of cycle between public and private ownership. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out where these firms were located. And this was a map from MCARE's website about where they uh, were located. And, and you sort of squint and look at this and wow, that looks pretty similar. And so we spent a bunch of time trying to back out where they were located. Turns out each of these dots is like the size of a city, so you gotta really sort of work at it. Um, called every hospital, figured out when these companies entered and exited, and tried to figure out what happened. And so this is a, a regression discontinuity, an event study, looking at what happens in the 12 months before and 12 months after MCARE either enters or exits a hospital. And what you basically see is it goes from having no out-of-network bills before to having no in-network care after the company comes in. And when the company exits, it goes from having no in-network care to going back to no out-of-network care. We published this in, I guess, I guess it was like 2018. It, it got some policy traction. It was the, the lead story in the front page of the Times. MCARE was not delighted. Um, that, that we did this. Um, and to his credit, Lamar Alexander, who's a senator who recently retired from Tennessee, took this issue on as really his sort of last push as a, a legislator. And there was this amazing sort of period of bipartisan unity. President Trump talked about in the State of the Union, Democrats and Republicans were for it. And all of a sudden, um, KKR, who had bought Blackstone recently, started seeing bond yields explode. Yeah, they did. Um, so, they, so they bought it at 97 cents on the dollar. Their bond yields went down to 80 cents, 87 cents on the dollar. Right, that's like default territory. And all of a sudden, ads started flooding television. Right, and the New York Times did this story about this group called Doctor Patient Unity who wouldn't say who funded them, who ended up spending initially 28 and then 100 million dollars in 2019 on ads. If this works, you'll be able to see it.
imagine if the care we needed wasn't there when we needed it most. Remind Senator Gardner that government rate setting could mean closed hospitals. It's not the answer for surprise billing. This was the largest television ad by, by a single entity in 2019. The New York Times did another deep dive into this. Who funded this? KKR and Blackstone, the owners of Team Health and Envision. I spent two years basically commuting from New Haven to DC to work on this. And it was really close to, the solution to it was really close to passing in December 2019 in an omnibus spending bill. And it got scuttled at the 11th hour. And it got scuttled in particular by one member of Congress, Richie Neal, who's the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Anybody want to guess who made it a $30,000 campaign contribution in December? Blackstone. <laughs> now, the good news is the next year it passed. So in 2020, it was part of the omnibus spending bill. Uh, the bill had two provisions. Um, one, it stops patients from getting out-of-network bill, uh, uh, high cost sharing when they get an out-of-network bill. Second, it figures out a mechanism to settle disputes between hospitals and physicians. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that this is going to reduce spending by about 1%. Back to where I originally started, this is how I think you fix health spending, right? One bite at a time. Right. There aren't country music songs that are written about incrementalism, but I actually think this is sort of how you, you do it. Here's the challenge. Immediately after, the American College of Emergency Physicians sued the Department of Health and Human Services over the implementation of the No Surprises Billing Act, saying that it favored insurance companies. Who are the presidents of the American College of Emergency Physicians? Um, the last three were leaders at MCARE, Team Health, and then MCARE. About three weeks ago, the district court in Texas that everybody goes to to get a sympathetic hearing for conservative ideas blocked the arbitration component of the No Surprises Act. Right? Kept the patient component, but blocked the sort of rate setting or sort of negotiation component. Not clear how this is going to end up. This, for me, is why the U.S. health system is important or is expensive. Right? It isn't, in, at least in my view, single payer versus private insurers. It's that stuff like this exists in every single quarter. And what worries me is I actually think we could shift to single payer. The challenge is the lobbying is going to have the same pernicious effect then, in many ways, as it does now. So what are the roles, or what role can economists play? I think numerous, but I'll focus on four. We need a constituency for efficiency in U.S. healthcare and for equity. But there's a constituency for doctors and diabetics and cancer patients and physicians and for hospitals. Where is the constituency for making the health system better? Right? There actually isn't a unified constituency for that. The second, and this is something Neil Mahoney and I refer to as sort of economists as the fifth estate. We can do a lot of discovery using data. You know, you've done amazing work on it for inequality. And it's, in a sense, doing investigative work akin to what journalists do. But as economists, in a sense, being referees and holding market participants to account. I think the third is, like the work Marcel has done, being very, very specific about who bears the burden of rising health spending in the US. And then I think it's fourth, taking the next step and being willing to say it publicly. And being to, willing to sort of step outside of the academy and engage with policymakers and the public to shift these sorts of conversations. So with that, I, we have a little time for Q&A. Mostly want to hear what Marcella says, and, and we'll go from there. So I guess we're supposed to open it up for, for questions. Um, to be honest here, so should we do, like take three questions at once and then we can all loop through? Maybe that's the easiest way, so we'll go back. Yeah. Very quick question. A few years ago, Atul Gawande did a study of the two 
I'm sorry. A few years ago, I told Gwandi to the study of the two Texas cities where one matched demographics, one was for profit, one was not for profit hospitals, huge discrepancy. Has more of that kind of research been conducted? Did you want three in a row, Zach? Yeah, why don't we do three in a row and then we'll all loom back around? Okay. Margaret Levy, Stanford Political Science. So why only economists in the fifth estate? <laughs> why not political scientists, sociologists, data arrogant, scientists? Terrible, yeah. Can't we join in? Please, more, more of the merit. The pool is big. It is inclusive. <laughs> yeah, I totally endorse Anathan Maddy from Stanford that uh, all of us need to be closer to investigative reporting and get in the dirt of politics because that's what it is. Specifically to your point about emergency uh, and private equity, uh, what happened, I understand, after this, uh, the No Surprise Bill um, was so there's this stuff about hospice and Medicare and False Claims Act and all these hospice companies. So apparently the insurance companies then like refused to pay because um, they couldn't charge anybody. So, uh, you know, this battle between the private equity firms and the insurance uh, companies is kind of a weird um, situation from the perspective of all of us who end up paying whatever it is. So I wonder if you could comment on, on sort of where, you know, who's more evil or something. <laughs> so I can give a quick stab to the, the Atoll Gwande question, then, you know, we can all take different parts. Yeah, I think, why don't you start? So, you know, I, I, I think he's really right about Medicare. Sure, he's really accurate about what drives Medicare spending. Um, my work, in a sense, shows that Medicare spending is basically wholly uncorrelated with private health spending. And so it turns out McAllen is actually below average for the privately insured, and most of the places that get heralded as being efficient for Medicare, like Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, where President Obama actually went to sort of say, if you like the ACA, you're gonna love, or if you like Grand Junction, you're gonna love the ACA, we take Grand Junction and spread it to the country. Turns out Grand Junction has among the, the highest insurance premiums and health spending for the, the country. So I think it's just, healthcare is complicated. Um, and I don't think the story is quite as simple as, as sort of for-profits and, and non, you gotta treat Medicare, Medicaid, and the privately insured separately. I'm gonna um, call on Ileana, because I know she, um, she alludes to that Atul Gawande piece in her um, in her memo on um, on Medicare for all. I mean, well, yeah, I, just, I, mean uh, I just I have to say, I, have to say I, quote I, I, I Zach's, quote Zach's um, um, conclusion, conclusion in his QJ paper, paper when I teach, when I teach the stuff, stuff that, that, that you, know, uh, Medicare you know Medicare is a single payer, a single payer system, system where at least the traditional part of Medicare, part of Medicare, Medicare there's a private Medicare, 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 Medicare that's a bit differently. Uh, you know the government has prices, so the only variation you're going to get is variation in quantity. Like literally can't can't that is that is just mathematically the only way one place can be more expensive than the other. So it kind of alludes to Marcella's point about just how, just how hard, hard it is, it is to, improve to improve U.S. healthcare in some sense because our data, data are, so are so bad that we that all just we all assume, just assume as a tool did, did, that, like, that well, something, well, something must be in the water in the and everyone's just, everyone's just using so much healthcare. healthcare. And then when Zach, and then when Zach looks, looks at it, you know, and, 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 and I believe Zach looks at the data that you now is now like hard to use now because it's proprietary. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So like we can't even like dig further because I think it's like, you know, the the, 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 private the, the private insurers has like their, like their proprietary, proprietary um, business, um, business secret data, like, data, like how much they actually pay for stuff. For stuff. Um, um, but when, but when, Zach when Zach did get it, it, we found like we the found lessons, like the lessons from Medicare, Medicare really didn't really translate. translate. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's yeah, just, I mean, it's a, just a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a system, system where we can't where we even, we don't even know what the, well, what I always say private insurance, it seems so expensive. Um, and it is, and it is basically tasked with covering, with covering a population, a population that, is that is non elderly, non disabled, non -disabled and healthy, and healthy enough, to work. enough to work. And so and it's so it's to, to cover a very, very healthy, healthy population. population. And, yet, and yet, gosh, we still, gosh, pay, we still pay a lot in, in premiums. I'm sure, I'm sure all of you feel all that way. Feel that way. Can run out of your paycheck. Um, um, and, uh, and uh, we can't, we even, can't study even study this expensive, this expensive sector, sector of, of the health insurance, health insurance system very system effectively because effectively we don't, get, we the don't get the data. Just second all of that and just say, um, I think the fact that the data are proprietary is a huge issue. And yes, it can make papers, um, but it is, it's not the way uh, we should be actually trying to improve health.
And maybe the, the final question, which was about sort of who's worse. I, I don't think there's an entity in the U.S. that has a sort of monopoly on virtue or vice, right? Like, I, I think, I think surprise billing really illustrates the, the challenge. It pits insurers against physicians. And both sides dug in. And one of the things I would say is the highest represented profession, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, in the top 1% are physicians. Or economists. Right, yeah, we, we do, <laughs> yeah fair enough. Yeah. You should normalize yeah, it by right, economists. Though. Exactly. Um, we don't see insurance company or insurance executives struggling. And so you have this sort of death battle between the two. And who lost out? It was the majority of Americans for whom a $400 or $500 bill broke them financially. And, th and this is kind Sorry. of why I worry about incrementalism. And I know it rolls back to McCain-Feingold and whatnot, but I, I do think that it's sort of just playing whack-a-mole. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you say that you do community rating and then they select on, you know, Spanish commercials to screen skim or they select on what networks and what physicians are a network or what what's on formulary. So. Um, it does. It does feel a little bit like, um, yeah. I, I, I. My tastes are not for incrementalism, but yeah. that's why we're friends. No, <laughs> and, I, and maybe I'll give the, the plug for incrementalism, which I think it's. I think that it's the least worst way to go forward. That is, like, I. I would love a wholesale. We do the system, and, and I think we need Stephanie to do some surveys on how many people are for that yeah. wholesale. Wholesale. Uh, but it's just um, how you get there. Yeah. And I, I just think it's very, very hard to get from where we are today. We think where we'd all want to get to. And the question is, what is the path that's most likely to be politically feasible to get us there? One, should we do one last one and then we'll, we'll break? Sure. I just wanted uh, Henry Farrell. I'm at Johns Hopkins, also a political scientist. I just wanted to really observe, uh, echo what Margaret says and add something to it, which is we need country and Western. I mean, you know, so I was looking at that uh, presentation. I thought that it was a barn burning presentation, a rabble rousing presentation. And then we get at the end, we need a constituency for efficiency. I don't think we're going to get a political constituency for efficiency. You need to have um, sort of that country and Western thing, which is you don't talk about efficiency. Uh, you try to achieve efficiency, but you tell people they are getting screwed. Uh, that is how you appeal to people. And that is what your charts basically said to me. So I really think you know, that this needs to be brought beyond economists. I think that it needs to be I'm sorry, not just talking to so social scientists, but to people more generally. And I think that that is the mood music that economists, if economists want to uh, achieve inclusive prosperity, they need to learn politics. And I really <laughs> think that what you provided there was a fantastic basis for thinking about this politically rather than just in terms of efficiency. I mean, I think, so I, I look, the, the reason surprise billing, I think, happened was because of two journalists, Reed Abelson and, and Margot Sanger Katz, who used the bully pulpit of the Times to put the issue out there. And it was so repugnant that you couldn't look away. The scary thing for me, and this is the pessimistic view, is like it didn't get worse. It doesn't get much worse than surprise billing. And it was like five years and like, like an MMA fight to fix it. How do you do those stuff that's sort of more in the gray? And yeah, I think it's, I think it's hard. Yeah, with that.